It is Wednesday afternoon, January 26th. Amazing. We're through almost one twelfth of this year. <laughs> Where does it go? And we are going to pick up in Genesis, Bereshit. We are going to be picking up in chapter two. All I'm going to say in the way of review for chapter one is when we conclude at the end of chapter one, there's one word that should have just really stood out through the whole, from verse one all the way to the end of the chapter. And that word is the subject of the first sentence of our entire Bible. The in the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. God is our subject. God is the attention getter. God is where our attention should be drawn. He dominates through that first chapter. I think we've had, well, I, I didn't go count, but probably almost every verse is either, and God said, or is, and God blessed, all the way through. If you see God as the subject of chapter one, if you see him in his role, in its entirety, in, in how high and lifted up, how majestic and how mighty, how great our God is, then you will have no problem with the whole rest of the Bible. You're set in a good place. You will be able to believe what you read because if God could create this universe the way that we have discovered he did, then how can you not believe the other miracles that we're going to read about? How can you not believe in the virgin birth? If God could create earth out of nothing, if God could create man out of the dust of the earth, breathe into him, make him a living soul, how can he not put a seed in a woman's uh, womb and bring forth the Son of God without sin nature? No problem. And I'll ask you, what is your issue, your question, your problem? If you see God the size he should be from chapter 1, your problem diminishes. What can God not do? And scripture tells us, with God, all, all things, things are, are possible. possible. So, <clears throat> keeping that in mind, we're going to move on into scripture. I would love to tell you that we're in a study that we would take every book and take it in order and take it chapter by chapter and we'd get one day to the book of Revelation, but I hope we'd never make it that far because we're on with him first. <laughs> because if you think uh, it took us time for chapter one, can you imagine going through it all? <laughs> but wherever you pick up and whatever study you're in, see God in it and see him in relation to who he is. When we go into chapter 2 now, we're going to continue on studying creation. It's not over yet. God's giving us a little more space here in the Word of God to look at it really from a different view. This isn't going to be a rehash. He's going to fill in some of the areas that we just had a sketchy outline. We're going to get more detail, especially in regard to man. That when we start, we start with a verse very similar but very different from verse 1 in chapter 1, but again it's telling us, thus the heavens and the earth were completed, or they were finished. What I want to point out is what we saw in chapter 1 also, there is absolutely not one schmidgen of space for evolution. It just doesn't get a chance. There is a false teaching out there that says, yes, God created but what he did was he created the evolutionary process. He started it, and then he let evolution take over. Oh. Well, what do you do with verse 1 of chapter 2 then? The heavens and the earth have been completed. It's not a process of millions of years. It's not this form morph morphing into that form. And we saw that the evolutionary process going from the lower to the higher is not the way God created it's not in that order, nor do we find any intermittent, any in-betweenies, <laughs> any halves that we should see were that to be true. And I would also like to say, if, if man's evolved because man was better than the animals that man evolved out of, then should not something better than man be evolving by now because you can't tell me this is the best. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're ruining our world, we're, we're killing our environment, we are killing each other. This could not be the glory, wow, this is it, hold us up, no. But yet when God did create man in his image, 
And that's the whole key that separates him from everything else God created. He did, in essence, make man his crown and glory of his creation. But keep in mind, we've never seen that side. We've only seen man after the fall. We've only seen the earth after the fall. We have no idea the glory that was there before. And chapter 2 and 3 is going to open us up to kind of try to take a look at what that might have looked like because it's very different than what we're seeing now. Very interesting too. But again, God did not set it in motion and then let it evolve. He didn't put it in motion and then say, how about it? No, he said he completed. It's finished. It's done. Put a period at the end. And we will see actually that we are going to put a period at an end of a sentence. Not quite yet, but we will see that when we come to it. After our, our introduction here of the heavens and earth being completed, it says, and all their hosts. Now, if we keep it in context, we're going to see here, hosts is referring to the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavenly hosts. Okay, let me show you Deuteronomy, Davarim, and chapter 4 and verse 19. Deuteronomy, chapter 4 and verse 19. And by the way, anyone who does not have cross-references, do let me know. I think everybody has them by now. 419. Okay, verse 19 says, And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven, and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. In other words, God made the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the other heavenly hosts for us. He made them for us. Now, we know they're made for his glory. We know that we glorify him when we look at them and say, Wow, God. But what we don't want to do is look at them and worship them. We want to worship the God who created them, not them. But notice how very clearly the hosts of heaven are sun, moon, stars, and all such like. Look also, another witness to that, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 22. Jeremiah 33 and verse 22. Where we read in verse 22, whoops, of chapter 33, As the host of heaven cannot be counted, would that not be the stars? And I laugh when the first time they counted stars, and I don't know where they were looking and how they could think it, because before you had electric lights, I know you saw billions of stars we don't see now, but they came up with a very small number. It was less than 100. I don't know if they thought it was being repeated. I have no idea how they could have said that. But regardless, every time man thinks, oh, I've measured heaven, I've got it, I know how far it goes out there, I know where it ends, God laughs and then reveals something that's even further out there. We know that there's a galaxy just hanging in space. What, what was that, 38 million light years out there? I don't even remember. But so, so far past my ability to fathom that mathematically that it's amazing. And when someone was asked, what's it doing out there? The answer came back, oh, just hanging around and giving glory to God. <laughs> I loved that. <laughs> if you haven't seen that video, see me later, and I'll, I'll get you a link to that video. Now, the one thing that's not mentioned in the sun, the moon, the stars, you know, the starry host of the heavens, is something that often we hear referred to as the host of heaven. Anyone have a clue? Angels. Angels. Very good. Very good. But we're not noticing them here because they weren't created at this time. When God created the, the heavens and the earth as he gave us in chapter 1, I believe that the angels already had been created. They were not created during this time. They were not created bound to the earth. It's a whole different, um, I want to say atmosphere, wrong word, but a whole different sphere. I'll just leave it at sphere since I can't think of the right word. Oh, yeah, because then, I mean, Satan had already fallen. Very good. Dora's thinking, I love it, I love it, I give her an A+. Plus. Satan, an angel, had already fallen in his pride from the place that God gave him. Really, we believe the hierarchy of the angels, he was on top. 
Yes, so, and we see many other times in scripture where we'll, <coughs> we know that this was not the time of angelic creation. Look with me at 1 Kings. <coughs> Excuse me. We have wind up here today, and it's wreaking a bit of havoc with my sinuses. 1 Kings 22. In 1 Kings 22, we'll look at verse 19, and we see here in verse 19, Micaiah said, and I ruined that in Hebrew, but that's okay. I'll move on. Uh, I think you say Micaiah. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord. Ooh, I'd love to say this. <laughs> I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. First now, Kings what? Uh, first Kings 22 and verse 19. Yeah. It should be showing up in chapter 2 and verse 1 on your cross references. But it's not. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> really? Did yeah. I miss it? Yeah, the same as uh, Deuteronomy 30, you got the, you just said 419. 419, not 30. Yeah, you're in chapter there. 2, verse 1 on yeah, the list. Page 10 you're on? It's on Genesis 2, 16, but you Okay, it. yeah, but you're the page before. Oh, page 10. Side? Page 10. I think you're going to be on page 10. Okay. So you need to be in chapter 2, verse 1. You're in chapter 2, verse 16. Okay. Let me pull that for you. Okay. There we go. Oh, and that even starts with verse 4. You need page 9. <laughs> Let me get you page 9 because you probably didn't bring it with you. We're on page 9 in the cross-references. If you yeah, have another one, I have 10 and 11. Okay, I've got, yes, I've got several 9s here. Anyone else want a 9? I've got a whole lot of 9s. That means a whole lot of you didn't show up one day. <laughs> Do you need it? Okay. Okay. Sorry, folks, out in Zoom land, but maybe no, I don't even want you to need. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe some of you can look it up in your emails while we're doing it. Um, when I give out the cross references, I try to give them ahead so that you've got a, a jump start, and so we don't have a problem at the last minute. Now, if you look on page nine, you find chapter two, and you find verse one. What, uh, what Genesis, chapter 2, 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 and he sees the host on his right and on his left. Now, God's throne is not where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. We know that. He is a third heaven, as, as Scripture gives it. We breathe down here. Then we have where the planes fly and, and, and the hosts of heaven are that we're referring to as sun, moon, and stars. But then we have above that God's heaven, where we go when we go home to be at the Lord. And it's huge and it's magnanimous and we haven't a clue <laughs> but if he's not seeing and he's not sun moon and stars standing on the right and the left of god who is he seeing in god's heaven would it not be angelic so in this case the hosts of heaven are angelic hosts that's why you have to let context help you understand who we're, we're talking about in genesis 2 and verse 1 We've been talking about the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars. We've called them the hosts of heaven. So we know that from chapter 1, that two one, chapter 2, verse 1, is referring to sun, moon, stars, all, all of that. But don't take that and say every time you read the word hosts in Scripture, it has to be that. In fact, you just barely scratched the surface of this. Now, when were the angels created? We don't know. But we do know that there is a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. That the chaotic form on the face of the earth was not the way God created it originally. Remember when we went back and we studied that? God creates perfectly. He doesn't create chaos. There was a judgment, we believe, that came on this earth because it was Satan's domain. So when Satan fell, his, his kingdom suffered the consequence also. And then we have the, you could almost call it a recreation of, as we know, the heavens and the earth in relation for us now. God did this and then he put Adam on earth, in earth. How do I say that the right way? He brought him into relation 
with the earth that he has put into habitable form for mankind. Okay, so we are going to be looking at earth in relation to a dome, but here what we're, ta and, and that works, okay, here what we're talking about then is the sun, the moon, and the stars. If you want to read about Satan falling, look later at Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12 starts it, and I'll just read you that first part, but you'll want to keep reading um, I didn't write how far, but keep reading until the, the part is complete. In verse 12 of Ezekiel 28, um, actually, actually should have started back. Let's start with verse 12 real quick. We went through this before, so I won't do as much detail. But remember when it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus is the Lord God. Okay, so this is being directed to the king of Tyre. That's a person, a human being living on this earth. That's not the name of an angel. But as we often see in scripture, there is a, a close and a further. There's a near fulfillment and a greater fulfillment. There's a type and there's an antitype. When you start reading the lamentation against the king of Tyre, you're going to see, wait a minute, this goes far beyond the king of Tyre. Because this one, it says you had the seal of perfection. Now, the only one that could come close to that would have been Adam in his original state, Adam, when God created him. But this is saying, you, you had the silk profession, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Okay? Now we know we're not talking about the king of Tyre. We're talking about a time prior. But the king of Tyre is a smaller picture of what took place with Satan. <clears throat> and then it goes on gives a description of what he was like. And that this is how he was found before sin was entered into him, the sin of pride. Once he decided he wanted to be equal to God, it was all over. And we know that even though he's not in his eternal demise, which is in hell forever, which is what God made hell for, the devil and his angels, that's Matthew 25, verse 41. But we know that even now he's on his way down. And his full intent is to take as many as he can with him. And we pray God to use us to snatch those out of Satan's closet and prevent them from going to an eternal place of torment apart from a loving God forever. Now, keep in mind, though, again, we've got hosts meaning sun, moon, and stars. We've got hosts that mean angels. We look at the context. We're going to look at that word host just a little bit more from the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is sabbat, and I'll put it up here. If you can't see it, I am spelling it T-Z-E-V-A. <coughs> Now, you might see it sometimes spelled slightly differently than that. In fact, I'm actually going to change my E to an A right now because that is the more common. Okay? Saba. We'll put it that way. Even sounds closer, probably easier for you that way. That comes from a root word. Oh, sorry. You're going to have to tell me what you wrote down. Okay. Um, you can turn the chair. That's what I set it for now. Turn the chair? Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he's smart. <laughs> okay. Can you see over there? Um, yes. I can, I can I do it back and forth. I can't see anyway. Okay, well, it's T Z A V is in victory A. Okay, easier is the root. The root, even though, see, T Z sounds a lot like our S sound, also, it shouldn't. You should hear more of a T and a Z, but in our English, we sound like the S. And the root is Saba, but it's spelled S E B A. S as in Sam. E, B is a boy, A. Okay? So that's all I'm writing down below this yeah. is Saba. Yeah. Okay? Or Saba. And leave it at that angle because there's no more blur now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then we're good. Okay. okay. And Loretta, you good? Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> that root word in the Hebrew talks about or means that which goes forth like an army to go forth in war, in war, warfare. It can be a host of armies. It can be a host of organized angels. It can be a host referring to sun, moon, and stars. It can be, what else? Um, you've got so much here. Warfare, service, going out. It can be used in many ways. So again, when you have a word like that, you've got to look in your context to find out what it's meaning. Let me introduce you to one thought of this. On our way back to Genesis, we're going to stop off at uh, Joshua. Yeshua? 
Joshua chapter 5 and verse 15. This is a time when Joshua is about to go into battle and he sees something right in front of him. Does it say it from verse 15? It doesn't. Okay. Um, verse 13 tells us what I'm telling you. Now it came about when Joshua is by Jericho, Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked. Okay? So Joshua is looking. He's near Jericho and he's looking and he sees, behold, hello, pay attention. <laughs> he sees a man standing, was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua said to him, are you for us or are you against us? He has no clue who this man is, but this man is a man ready for war, sword drawn, and Joshua doesn't know whether to cower, run, fight, do, you know, join him. Where is it? Where is it coming from? Well, he finds out in verse 14 that it's the Lord himself appearing in what we call Christophany, in a form before he had his human form given to him that we read about in the Brita Hadashah, the New Covenant. In verse 15, the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua. That's a description given to this man now. The captain of the Lord's sabah, sabah, okay? The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. He bowed down and he worshipped him. He knew he was standing on holy ground. This wasn't one against him. This was one who's going to go into battle with him. But do you notice even the Lord himself is called the captain of the hosts. Now when he's the captain of the host and he's in a form like that, he's got his heavenly armies, but he's got his earthly armies too. So we've got all kinds of words in this host. But we see in this the power and the majesty of everything that God created from the humans to the angelic to the sun, moon, and stars, and he's the captain of it all. He's over it all. He is controlling it all. And I want to be like Joshua. I want to go to battle with him on his side, fighting for him, bowing in adoration, and praising his holy name. That all comes out of Saba, Saba. And if you are with us in our Shabbat services, you've heard many a times, Adonai Saba Ot. It's in one of the songs that we sing. And let me break that down now, because now you'll have even further understanding. Adonai is Lord, Sabaot, of hosts. It's just in the plural. Sabaot. Ot makes it plural. The Im usually makes it plural in Hebrew, but Ot can also. So it's saying when you're, really, when you're singing that song, you're singing to the Lord of hosts. And in your mind, it can be the Lord of the heavenly hosts, the Lord of the angelic hosts, the Lord of the human hosts, the Lord of it all praise his name. I love that. I love his name. And this is what we're seeing, the Lord of the armies. Uh, bringing it back to creation, though, let's bring it back into context. And a rabbi once said, you could say that the meaning behind Sava'ot or, or Sava in relation with creation would be like saying all of the atoms, all of the molecules, the vast array of them, they're all working together. They're all assembling, they're all acting, and they're all working toward a purpose. I see a well-oiled machine with all the little parts. Each, you know, this kink goes into this kink, and that makes this go, and this makes that happen, and it's all moving together, all for a purpose. It's like an army, and the army's gonna all move together. If you have an army go into battle, and you say go, and everybody shoots in different directions, are you going to win? <laughs> You're going to have defeat so fast that your feet will be defeated. <laughs> you need to come together and work as a unit. And in fact, that's the problem with many who get out of the service. They don't know how to think on their own anymore. They don't know how to be single and take care of just one. They're so used to thinking for the group and working as a unit that works together. Well, you never come out of the Lord's army. You never have to worry about, how do I think on my own? Just stay plugged into this one, Adonai Sabaot, and he will direct you. But when you think about all the atoms and the molecules and every little detail coming together in that way, do we see that thought scripturally? And I'll tell you with a resounding yes. Let me take you real quickly 
to 1 Shmuel, that's Samuel, 1 Shmuel, chapter 1 and verse 11. This is a sweet chapter. This is a young woman, well, I don't know how, how young or how old, um, actually, I shouldn't say that, but this is a woman that has been in childbearing years for a long time, and she um, is not the only wife of the man, and the other has children, and she doesn't. And oh, yeah. the pain is so severe. Mm -hmm. She has been hurting for so long. Her name is Hannah. Hannah. She's gone up to the temple every year and she praises the Lord and she worships him and she's being obedient to the commandments and she cries her heart out to the Lord. I want to direct you just to verse 11. Verse 11 says, she made a vow. She said, oh Lord of hosts. You know what she said? Adonai, Sabaot, this one that we've been just talking about. If you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. That means that there'd be a vow on him, and he would be in the Lord's service from birth to death, that that would be where he belonged, not with her and not in the world, but he would have a purpose. But do you notice what she's asking? She's asking, God, put life in my womb. Bring all those atoms and molecules and everything together that lines up that makes a human being. God, you created the universe. You're on a nice of a oath, the hosts of heaven glorify you. The God who created all that, you can give me a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I see her absolutely all over what we've just studied in chapter 2 and honoring him and glorifying him, and I believe that he looked down and saw the faith of this one, heard her cries, and said, yes, I will glorify myself in meeting your request. I'll bring all those little details together and create a beautiful human. And he grows up to be the first prophet of Israel. Yes. First Samuel, yeah. what? Samuel. What was that? So, first Samuel chapter 1. Verse 11 is a verse I read. That she cried out to the whole host of heaven. Can you imagine to, uh, giving your child, a, who knows what age, but four or five? Right, right. And, and he has can't go home with mama compared to the kids today. Mm -hmm. They'll be a screaming fit. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't oh, yeah. scream about it. No, no. I believe that God gave him a heart for the Lord himself mm -hmm. also. I believe that the Lord comforted him, him in a way his mama in a different way. She did see him every year when she went up, and I can only imagine the joy going up, but then the sadness leaving. It wasn't easy. But God gave him but, more children. Yes, yes, God blessed her with more. Not that each one isn't, you know, precious and has that special place. Mm -hmm. But he knit together in her womb. The God of creation knit together in her womb. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful, a beautiful thought. There is so much more to that name. Adonai Sabaot. So much more. When we went through a study of the names, that's one of the names we stopped and we studied on. And yes, he has a myriad. Do you know what myriad means? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't count it. It's mm -hmm. millions and millions and millions and millions and oh, you're yeah. still going on. Myriad. There are so many. He is above a myriad of angels. He snaps his finger if he wants to snap his finger or he speaks and says do or go or be or whatever and all those angels move in accordance with his pronouncement his will his way he is the mighty warrior great in battle captain of the army of hosts he is the conductor of the beautiful orchestra of creation <laughs> Do you hear it? I hear some of it right now because the wind is blowing outside mm -hmm. of our doors. He is the orchestrator of it all. I stand in awe at the creation around us and the fact that it doesn't collide, that it doesn't fall apart, that we don't wake up in the morning and pray, oh Lord, don't let your son go out today. And I don't mean S-O-N, no. I mean S-U-N. We don't pray, Lord, don't let me fall off this earth. Make gravity work. I'm so concerned. <clears throat> Now, we live with these things 
with a total and full expectation that they're going to keep working because he is orchestrating. And he's not just orchestrating our creation, he is orchestrating all of those galaxies out there that are all glorifying him, that are all serving different purposes. I haven't a clue what, but I know one day we're going to sail past them. And yet, I'm going to go back and look at them too. <laughs> and just say, wow, God, we thought the Hubble telescope was something... <laughs> <laughs> that was like a kindergartner drawing a picture <laughs> compared to the masterpiece that that uh, whoever's your master. Remember you showed us that video of the all the stars and the galaxies. Amazing, oh, is it not? The it's colors, not, the colors, the amount, the size, yeah. the distance, the it's designs, so awesome. and we haven't hardly begun to know all of our God who has created, but every atom. Every molecule, everything is moving in accordance with his purpose and at his command. That's why I say when you catch this vision, then why do you worry? Why do you stress? Why do you fret so? This should put us in alignment like Hannah. God, I'm pleading with you. Here's the need. You can do it, God. With you, nothing is impossible. He sustains everything everything just by his powerful word just his word remember the one who said lord you don't have to come to heal my child you just say the word and my daughter will be healed and the lord said because of his faith his daughter was healed and when the report came she was healed the hour that he said it that means the very same time that doesn't mean it took That's an hour powerful. it <laughs> means that very same time Yes, God, you're in your heaven. You are sitting on the throne and right to your right hand, waiting for the enemies to be his footstool, is our Adonai Sabaot. But he hears the little whimper, the neediest cry, and he works, orchestrates all creation to answer that. You ever seen God in split-second timing? <laughs> wow. Now... How many people over the face of the earth is he doing that for at the same time? Where you know that you moved and this one moved at just the right to come together. And he's doing it all over. And all he's doing it, 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 it's no effort. It's just spoken in a step. Go, do, yes, no, do, do, go, go. I'm out of words. <laughs> Back in Genesis. Back in our first verse, the heavens and the earth were completed. All their hosts, everything was completed. This is the whole entire completion of creation that is our world. It's all done. Nothing's left to be finished now. Hebrews stresses this also. He is not creating the universe today. Uh, does that mean he's not creating anywhere? Oh, I would oh, yeah. limit God for a moment. I have no idea what else he's doing and where else he's doing it, what else he's doing, because we, we're so finite and we're so all we can think of is something we know. So I'm not saying that, but in relation to us, creation has been completed. He's not making new animals or making something other than the category of animal. He's not, you know, no, no new whatever. We're all, it's all finished. Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4, and then I'll drop down to verse 10, to tell us, For we who have believed entered the rest, just as he said, As I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So work is finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. We're going to talk about what that rest means in just a bit. Verse 10, For the one who has entered his, who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Right now I'm just going to tell you in that resting, what it's saying is God was finished, completed his work. Creation's done. He's created everything he intended to create on this earth, for his man, who he's putting onto this earth to have dominion over this earth. It's all done. And by saying this on the seventh day, we don't read anywhere in scripture about an eighth day, ninth day, tenth day. We also now have the week set. 
There was a time in history that they tried to make a 10-day week. I think it was, I may even have it in my notes, but I'm not seeing it. I, I, I want to say, oh my goodness, I'm not going to say it because I could be so wrong, but there was one who was like an emperor who tried to establish a 10-day work week for his country, and it just, every, the wheels fell off. <laughs> it did not work. God made us with a seven-day work week work week, and I'm not talking the days to work and the days off, I don't mean that, but a week, seven days, that's what works, and everything works in relation to that. In our weeks and months, we have years. In our timing, we have the seasons, we have the new moons, we have the feasts that come into play. Everything just revolves around what God set into motion on the seventh day. So I believe he was establishing time as we know it in this creation also. That's why we're given on day one, on day two, on day three. God gave us mm -hmm. the blueprint. And there's no reason to try to change it. Now, by saying he rested, what he's telling us in that is not, and I know you all know it, God didn't say, Oh, I am so tired. I've been working so hard. I've got to sit down and catch my breath. Look at all I've done. I'm worn out. 100% human, right? God's anything but. He's a spirit. So yeah, he's he's a spi tired. He, he, no, no, and he's not. He, he never has entered into tiredness or fatigue or anything like that. That's actually not his plan for man either. That's you know, the fault of sin. But what he's telling us is everything was completed and he told us it was good. How many times did we hear that over and over in that chapter? God saw it and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. Well, he has now ceased. He's rested because he's completed. He's finished his work of creation. And this is the only Shabbat that we see God ever celebrating as far as we see in Scripture. Now, we're going to hear about Yeshua and his life celebrating many Shabbats. But the only one we hear about for God is this one. And, and by the way, when I mean Shabbat, that's the Sabbath, that's the seventh day, that's the day of rest. But it could only be celebrated when there was nothing left to be done. God's setting into motion a precedence. That's why I'm laying this foundation down. It's going to show the completeness of his work, but it's also going to teach us the lesson of his rest. And what I read in Hebrews, if you didn't fully understand it, we'll be coming back to that and touching on that rest that they did not enter into. We'll talk about all of that also. But right now, again, he is showing the completion of the work of creation. The seventh day was a day to show completed, finished, a rest, a picture for his humankind who are going to enter into a rest on that day. But unfortunately, that seventh day, that rest that God wanted for man, gets marred by sin. It gets ruined by the fall, and because of the fall of man, God is now working again. I'm going to put it that way. It's a different type of work. God isn't now trying to fix his creation. Don't get me wrong. Although all creation suffers, but God has, has to work his way his work of salvation because man now needs to be saved. Man now needs to be rescued. What am I talking about? Look at Yochanan. Look at John chapter 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 34. We read in verse 34. Yeshua Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So God has work to do. Yeshua is carrying out his work. That's what we're reading about. What work would God have to do? Saving his people. Chapter 5 and verse 17. Yochanan 4. Now, I'm sorry. Chapter 5. Just go to the next chapter. You break it there faster than my tablet. Verse 17. But he answered them. Yeshua Jesus speaking. My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. If he's doing the work of the Father, the Father's doing the work through the Son, the two are one. We've got the Father and the Son both at work, and the only work that there can be is that work of redemption, the work to bring us salvation. Now, in a picture form, 
I find it very interesting to look at it in this way. Messiah rested on the Shabbat day in the tomb after the work was completed. Okay, the work was finished. The work was finished on the cross. Let me show you two verses there in, in John. Stay with John. Go to chapter 17. John 17, go to verse 4. And we read in verse 4, I glorified, you should Jesus speaking, I glorified you, God, on the earth, having accomplished the work which you've given me to do. So he's coming up toward the end of his time of ministry. He's going to go into the crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. And he's saying, I finished the work you gave me to do, Father. He's done what he was supposed to do. Now, it's, he didn't mean it was finished that moment because the actual moment when he cries out, it is finished. That's chapter 20. Go to John 20. And go to verse uh, 1. Chapter 20 and verse 1. And there we read, oh, oh, nope, sorry, so sorry. Uh, it's got to be in 19, and I put down the wrong reference. I'm going to have to hunt for it, or let one of you hunt for it for me if I don't find it real quickly. I know it's in John, um, so I'm looking back at 19 real fast. <clears throat> yeah, it's got to be coming up here. Uh -huh. Okay, I went too fast. Is it 30? 30 comes to my mind. Ha <laughs> ha, it's 30. Thank you, Lord. Okay, John 19, 30 is where we get it. Therefore, when Yeshua had received the sour wine, the last thing that had been prophesied that was going to happen to him that hadn't yet, when that had happened, now every bit of prophecy in regard to his human life, in regard to him being the sacrifice, in regard to him being our redeemer, buying back mankind, to breaking the power of Satan that we might have salvation, everything has been done, and he himself, Yeshua, cries out. In the Greek, which we have for John, it's tetelestai. One word, tetelestai. In our English, it is finished. And that finished is done, completed, put a period there, don't add anything after it. Don't say and, don't say but, don't say if, don't say since, put a period there. When he died on the cross, it was finished. There is nothing more. We don't add our works to it. We don't add cleaning ourselves up first. We don't add getting saved and doing something. It is <coughs> done. It is finished. It is completed. And with his work done, his body was placed in that grave and his body rested in that grave on the Shabbat. He rested. The work was done. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Just for a picture comparison. The Shabbat day, when we look at that, and I know I'm going to trip into that, so I'm going to handle it right now in a short form for you. The Shabbat day was never changed. You cannot correctly call Sunday Shabbat. It is Saturday. It's actually sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. Sunday is the first day of the week. Shabbat is the last day of the week. Shabbat is the end of the work week, and then you rest. The beginning of the new week is Sunday. It's actually from Saturday night through Sunday night, from sundown to sundown also. The first day of the week is beginning a new period. The Shabbat is completing the old period. The seventh day stands in Scripture connected to the world, to the earth, and the earthly rest. But the first day introduces us to heaven. It introduces us to a heavenly rest that we as heavenly people can enter into. So it's a whole different picture that we see. So that's how come they call it Shabbat Shabbat on Saturday. Yes. Because he was in the grave on Saturday. Especially they called it Shabbat long before that. That's the Hebrew word that means Sabbath. Oh. Okay. But when they say Shabbat Shalom, Sabbath peace, Sabbath rest, you know, it is a cessation of work and is the blessing of the Lord. And it's for that day and that day only. Yes. Yes. And we see a picture of Messiah resting because his work's completed. Then we look at what happens the next, the morning resurrection, which is where I started to take you and why I had that scripture in there, John 20 and verse 1. Um, 
and, my, and I'm still 19, so let me go there. What I need to read right now is then on the first day, or it says now, let me take my word then out, excuse me. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. Some of you get up that early. I don't like to. I like the sun to come up first. <laughs> but Mary got up, Miriam got up, and she went to the tomb before the sun got up that day. It's still dark. And when she got there, she saw the stone was already taken away from the tomb. Okay? So he resurrected before the sun came up that day, by the way. Okay? When he resurrected exactly, ask him. <laughs> I won't get into that controversy, but I can tell you it was before sunup. <laughs> okay? Um, and we'll leave that there because that's a whole other controversy. But what I want to point us to is we have um, entered in through his rest. We've entered in into a newness of life. We've entered into being a heavenly people. Scripture says, Philippians 3 and verse 20 says, we're citizens of... Oh. Thank you. Heaven. We're not citizens of this earth. We're citizens of heaven. My citizenship is right up there. It's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I get to claim that's my home. Down here, I'm just passing through. I'm here to be an ambassador. 1 Corinthians 5 or 2 Corinthians 5? I always mix up the two. 1 Corinthians 5, I'm an ambassador. 2 Corinthians 5 is the new life, the picture of the butterfly out of the cocoon. All things pass away, all things are new. But I'm an ambassador. Do you know what an ambassador is? Is an ambassador living in his home? No. He's out representing his home to wherever he's been sent. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul says we are. We are ambassadors of heaven. Heaven's our home. What should we be doing? Hey, let me tell you about my home. I've got citizenship there. You have a question? Well, I was going to say something. Okay, say it. You have always done present training for future reigning. True. Okay. True. Did you all hear him? He says right now, and it was my dad who said it all yeah. the time, and I <laughs> quote my dad, present training for future reigning. So when you're in your hardships and your trials and your struggles and all that, and you wonder why, mm -hmm. instead of saying, why, God? Say, okay, God. I'm learning something that's going to help me serve you by reigning with you later. Because that's what we're promised, ruling and reigning with the Lord. If we've been faithful to learn and be his servants and do what he's telling us to do, then he'll entrust us with even more, basically, during the millennium and on. But back on this now. Ambassadors should be telling everybody about our home. Our home is the greatest place. You want to go here. Let me tell you about my home. Number one, hey Dave, tell Terry, no need for surgery there. No hurt, no pain, no sorrow, no tears, no nothing. She'll have a perfect body. It won't wear out. It won't get tired. It won't get fatigued. And oh, by the way, Dave, no worries, no stresses, no having to take care of her. You two will both just be able to rejoice and enjoy and be blessed. And, it, and it's even more wonderful than I can tell you. But, but, but let me keep telling you, and let me tell you about the star heaven. Let me tell you the focal point. Let me tell you the brightest, literally and figuratively. That's this one that I call Yeshua. You may call him Jesus. I'll call him Adonai Sabaot. I'll call him the Lord of the hosts. And you can fill in the blank with everything that fits in the host, and he's Lord of it all. And let me tell you, one look in his face, one look at his eyes, you will never have felt as loved as that moment. He sees right through to the very soul, the very being of who I am, but he doesn't see me and the warts and the frailties and the boo-boos and the mistakes and the wake of alts. He sees me beautiful and he sees me perfect. Because he sees me through his shed blood. He sees me because he redeemed me. He loved me so much when I was yucky. He bought me a second time. He made me and then he bought me back. Because that enemy tried to winch between him. 
and me. And guess what? He's gone down in a flame of defeat. Ha, 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 ha. And yeah, look, well, pray for me because he's going to be on my tail. But I don't care because he's under my feet because I have my Lord in my heart. Oh, I can't wait for you to see all he's got for you. You think you live in a palatial place now? You think that's beautiful? Ha! You know what we do up there? We walk on gold. We walk on gold that's so beautiful, it's transparent. You can see reflection through it. The rainbows are gorgeous. The sea is crystal. It is so beautiful, further than your eyes can see. That's just our environment. That's where we get to live. You think gold's so great? It's asphalt up there. Everything's better. And wait till you see what you get to do for my God. The rejoicing and the singing. And yeah, you may be like me. I'm not a choir person. I can't even carry a tune. You don't want me in your choir. <laughs> you want me off in the camp that makes the joyful noises. But up there, my whole soul gets to rejoice freely because I'm in the presence of love. I'm in the presence of perfection. And he's perfected me. And I don't have anything wrong. Nothing bad ever happens. I don't hurt. My loved ones that are there with me because they believe like I do, don't hurt either. I've only begun to tell you. If, if, if I told you that the amount I've given you is about what a baby on the first day of birth knows about its world, that's about all I've given you, maybe, about this. And all I can tell you is it gets better and better and better. Now, do you want to live there? Who wouldn't want to go? <laughs> well, let me tell you how to get there. Now I'm doing the work of the ambassador. Now I'm doing what God made me to do because he made me to glorify him. He made me to reflect this. But while I'm stuck here, I need to remember that. So God's done something wonderful. He's put in a stop every week. Hold on, Michelle. I've given you the Shabbat, and this is my Jewish side speaking, okay? Because he's given the Sabbath to Israel, to the Jewish people. I've given you that day. Stop. Every week, stop. Quit working. Oh, hey, I like the sound of that. <laughs> Put the tools down. Rest. But while your body's resting, which it needs, and God made us that way, after sin, <laughs> Take that time. Look at that creation. Focus on me, the God of creation. Adonai Sava out. Spend some time with me. You're going to feel so refreshed and so renewed, and you're going to feel like you've had a little bit of heaven brought down to earth. And it's going to reinvigorate you, and it's going to strengthen you, and it's going to pick you up, and it's going to carry you through this next week. Because, uh, by the way, I know what's coming up. You don't, but I do. Both the, the good and the bad. But I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to carry you through. And if you spend time with me now, you talk with me, you read my love letter to you, and you spend time in prayer with me, you're going to have the strength you need. You're going to have the answers you need. You're going to have everything for what's coming up. Because I'm going to take care of you in every level, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, anything I miss. God's going to take care of me. Prepare me, ready, and carry me through until I finally get to go to that home I've been telling you about. That's what Shabbat was all about. Stop and look at our God, our God who created. Then he gives us the second reason. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. I brought you into freedom. Well, wow. Is the picture of Messiah resting in that tomb? Is a picture of the redemption? the finished work, and I can look and see how he redeemed my people out of Israel. They went from being slaves to free. Well, right now, I'm a slave to sin. Sin's bound me. Sin causes me to suffer. Sin brings me pain. Sin hurts. Sin is a miserable existence. And God says, right. I don't want you content here and happy here because I want to bring you to the better. I want to free you from it. I want to redeem you so much that I'm going to shed my blood because yours can't do it. The requirement 
is shed blood. It is death for sin. But I'm going to give it to you freely with perfect blood that can redeem you because when it's perfect, it can buy back. And I'm going to put that blood on the mercy seat in heaven so that you can go up into heaven one day. That's what Shabbat reminds me every week. God who created the magnanimous creation, who shows me how powerful and great and mighty and holy he is, puts on a face, slips into time and space, and buys me back through his shed blood that I can have a perfect relationship with him forever in his home. And right now, let me be his ambassador, speak for him, and take as many of you with me as I can, because it's the greatest. That's what Shabbat's all about. Now, did you hear how it led into his resurrection? Because if he just stayed in that tomb, he would have paid the price of death, but that would be it. But he didn't just pay it. He conquered it victory over it. He brought life out of death, and we see it by his resurrection out of the grave, out of the tomb. Before the sun rose, he's out. The stone was rolled back, not to let Miriam in, but to show the world that he came out. We see an empty tomb. I've stood there in that empty tomb. I cannot tell you the sensation that goes through from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and every little cell's <laughs> invigorated. It's just on fire and it's screaming, he's risen, he's risen, he's risen, he's alive and he did it for me. And yeah, you end up in a bucket of tears and that's okay. <laughs> in that, I want to remember that first day of the week that he did raise. And I want to celebrate that day of his resurrection. That's why most churches, because they're not under the Shabbat that God gave to the Jewish people as a sign between him and Israel and his covenant with them, but they're recognizing this is the Messiah who raised from the dead to give me that new life that 2 Corinthians 5 told us about. Old's gone, new here. The caterpillar in the cocoon, dead, out comes the butterfly, who's no longer bound to earth, but can fly into heaven. That's what the next day, that's what the first day of the week represents. So, in all honesty, for me as a Jewish believer, I want to spend that whole weekend in his house, in remembering, in celebrating, in recognizing. As a Jewish person, there is a connection with Shabbat. Can Gentiles enter into that? Absolutely. You're welcome. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> See it and enjoy it and embrace it. But you're not under commandment to keep the Shabbat. As a believer, absolutely stop. Take a day. Focus it on the Lord. Not on everything else that you've got to do and your, all the whatever and whatnot. <clears throat> Spend it with me. Focus with me. Remember, I came out of that tomb. I brought newness of life. I'm the one who's here to hold you and help you and carry you and make your life better here, let alone when I take you home. Now you got the best of both worlds. And that's what I love. Seventh day belongs to Israel. It belongs to her relationship with her God that God never, re I don't like that word, never breaks, okay? He keeps covenant. He keeps it perfectly. But the beginning, the new, the fresh start, the first day of the week belongs to the church family, we'll call it, for lack of another word right now. And I'm not picking an, an organization or a building. The church is the body of Messiah. So realize you're part of that and celebrate in that and fellowship in that and invite others to be a part of that. Again, if you want to see where Israel's commanded to observe the Shabbat, that's Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. In fact, let's go there um, because I'll, I'll show you a bit of contrast and difference here. Exodus 20 and verse 8. And here we read, and it makes it very clear. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Shabbat to keep it holy. How do you remember it? By keeping it holy. Now, God gives a whole list of how to do that. They're not to work. They're not to do all kinds of things so they can focus on Him. 
like our Jewish tour guide tried to explain to the Gentile people who are on our tour group. <coughs> Exodus what? Exodus 20, 20 and verse 8. eight. He okay. said, what, is, what kind of work is it to pick a flower? You, you can't tell me picking a flower is work. But we're told we're not even supposed to pick flowers. We don't pick up stones. We don't pick up sticks. We don't pick flowers. What, what's the meaning here? And he said, what God wants you to do is look at that flower. Instead of picking it and going on your way, stop, look at it. Look at the beauty of it. Look at how it's different from every other flower. Look at that color. Smell that. The fragrance is different with everyone. And in no time at all, you're starting to go, wow, God, you're amazing. Look at the variety you've given to us. And all you've done is look at a flower instead of picking it. You're stopping and resting and thinking and engaging your relationship with your God. This is what he's after. That's what he wants in the day of remembrance. Him to be remembered. Yes? So the Sabbath day, you know, like with Exodus and stuff, you can't even pick up a flower and, you, and they'll kill you for that? They believe if you pick up sticks, you should be stoned. If you work, you should be stoned. Because stoning was the method, the mode of, of punishment, capital punishment for them. And they believe that, whoops, they believe, sorry, I'm trying to uh, get to my next chapter also because it goes with it. They believe that God has given us strict guidelines, and he has. There's many, many rules and regulations. And if you are desecrating it, then they have a right to stop you from that desecration. Yeah, but if you just, maybe you're just picking up a stick and just, you know, doing nothing, just, you know, admiring how God's creation is, or even a flower. They are so concerned about yeah. adhering to the nth degree that my dad, being raised Orthodox Jewish, mm -hmm. is a, probably about six years old. The windows fogged up. And he started playing with his finger on the window. Normal. What a little kid would do. His auntie who's raising him comes along, slaps his hand, and says, uh 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 uh. No writing on the Shabbat. Because it takes work to write. It takes effort to write. <laughs> well listen that when the um, disciples picked the yes. wheat, walking through it and they wanted to Right, right. And they picked it to eat. Because they were hungry and in need. And that's when the Lord said, was Sabbath made for the man or man made for the Sabbath? And the mm -hmm. idea is, you know, you're not breaking the Shabbat because you reached to get something to eat. His Talmudim didn't break the law. They, man, put this strain on them how to keep it. Mm -hmm. They added a ton of commandments on top of the commandment. They added the pressure so great that they couldn't even keep it. And that's why when the Jerusalem Council is discussing what do the Gentiles have to do, Paul is saying, you want to make them, it wasn't Paul at that time, Peter, sorry, you want to make them keep what we can't, <laughs> you know, but they strain at the, how's that go? They strain Nats. at the gnat and swallow, no, they strain at the camel and swallow the gnat, however the expression goes, that they get caught up and they miss the whole thing. Yeah. So God wasn't saying, you should be stoned because you picked that flower, Loretta. But he was saying, stop from everything. Just rest and think of me. Now, if you need a billion bricks to come down on you to get you to sit there and rest, then here they are. Man's very good about saying you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other thing. But God's saying, but look at the principle. Look at the purpose. Look at the point. This is what I'm wanting. I'm wanting your heart. I'm wanting your attention. Why do we tell people, close your eyes when you're going to pray? Give me the scripture verse that says, Thou shalt close thy eyes when thou prayest. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone find a verse? <laughs> Want to give me Hezekiah 2.13? Look well, it up and go. see. Okay? <laughs> we tell people, close your eyes. Because when your eyes are closed, now I'm not thinking about Dora and Julie and, and what my kitty is doing and and the calendar in the wall reminded me, oh, I need to do that. Now you've got your mind shut down. You've shut out a lot of this. Well, you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And you're focusing more on what the purpose of prayer is. That's what they're doing. But they start giving it to you as this is letter of the law. And they start laying down all of these rules and regulations. 
and they, Yeshua called them up short and said, you, you know, you make it so heavy, man can't keep it. You've added burden on burden. Mm -hmm. Take my burden on you. It's light and it's easy. You know, th this is the comparison. But not getting too far sidetracked on that. Bringing it back in, what we're looking at here is God did say, stop, don't work. And he did mean don't work. They were not to keep their occupation going on the Shabbat. They weren't to, if they were stone masonry, they weren't to go to the quarry. They were to stop. They were to focus on God. They were to spend time with God. What does Sha'ol Paul tell us in our Hadashah, in our New Covenant? Pick a day, honor it to God. So we too, in the church family, the body of the Messiah, should be recognizing a day also. An ideal day, in my mind, is the day that recognizes he raised from the dead. He resurrected. Now, if you want to pick another day, maybe you have to work on that day for the job that you have. Then pick another day and make sure you do honor it to the Lord. Because that's what, what we're told in the Prilchat Shah. We get the privilege of enjoying Messiah's resurrection day. But nowhere are we commanded, thou shalt, and it has to be on what we call Sunday. Yeah, Paul just says, honor a day unto the Lord. The Shabbat was going to be a test to Israel. Are you going to be obedient to your God? Are you going to line up behind him? Are you going to follow his laws, his rules, his regulations? Are you going to stop from, well, I could make a whole lot more money if I worked on Saturday. Are you going to stop from that and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you to help me make my money on these days and not on the Shabbat because I'm going to honor you. That's what he was testing the Jewish people with. But again, in, in our time, we want to recognize that resurrection. And nowhere does God command the Gentile you sh since the cross that you have to go under the Shabbat and keep the Shabbat as the Jews do. We're told again, honor day to me. So we have that freedom that Israel didn't have. Israel wasn't ever told, choose a day. Israel was told, this is the day. You're to stop, rest, no work, and it's, it's a day that ties us to the earth where the other raises us to the heavens. Okay? So, in the past, the Jews kept the Shabbat by entering into their synagogues. They would read the Law and the Prophets, and they would realize Shabbat belongs to the Law. Now, I'm not telling you we get to throw all the law out when we're not Jewish, because look at what's happening in our world, where they're trying to throw out law right now, where they are trying to lessen police force and police strength. What's happening? Smash and grab, killings, everything's going up. All the crime rate is going up sky high in these areas where they're trying to hold back those who force enforcement of law. You do not want to live without law. Do you really think that God has released you and it's okay now to kill, to murder, to covet, to be an adulterer, to steal, to lie? Well, that's my whole point. No, no. What God saves you from, or I should say what Yeshua saves you from, is the condemnation of the law. He doesn't ever say, now, free for all, go do what you want. Take away law and go drive on the streets. <laughs> you don't have to stop at the red light anymore. You don't have to do 35 in a, or 25 in a residential zone. Can you imagine? You know, law is there for a reason. God never releases us from law. Obedience to him is always important. But the Jews knew Shabbat was under the law. They had to keep the law. They had to keep Shabbat. They, once they couldn't go to the temple, they've got their synagogues that are representation for them where they can go, come together, pray together, study the law and the prophets. Oh, that they would, that they might see and know who the greater one is, the, the one who fulfills our, the, the prophecy. <coughs> Presently, <coughs> excuse me, and we see this in the book of Acts, which is kind of like the in-between, going from what we see and learn in law to what we see and learn in what we call the Age of Grace, you have the believers coming together, breaking bread, celebrating his resurrection, and when did they choose to do it? The first day of the week. Okay, So they did it somewhere between Saturday sundown and Sunday sundown. 
Now, some started doing it every day of the week, but they were free. It was, it was a freedom. Nowhere did it say they had to do it at this time. Now, I want to point out to you also, Sha'ol Paul, who gives us many of our marching orders for it, how to live in our, sorry, the wind's got my kitty wound up, how to, to live out our life under, under grace, and I've, I've derailed my whole thought. Thank you, Max. <laughs> um, oh, where was I going? Okay, let me, let me just go back. Um, I talked about how they're, they're breaking bread. Ah, uh, it'll come back. It'll come back. First day of the week. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, Paul. I was bringing up uh, the one yeah, who Paul. teaches us that is also the one who you still see going to the place where the Jews gather. He entered in on their Shabbats. He kept the service, the Shabbat service with them. He kept the feasts. You see him hurrying to get back to Jerusalem, that he can be there to go up to Jerusalem for the feast that the, the three times a year the male Jews were required to go to Jerusalem for. You don't see him release himself from all of that. All of that de does point to Messiah. But we see the relevance of it still, because it's still a picture of that. So you see, you see Shaul Paul do both. You see him breaking bread. You see him gathering together where he tells them, Collect so that when we're together on the first of the week, you don't have to do your collection then. You know, we hear it. We hear him talk both. I guess that's where I take my example. Well, I do both because we have that, that freedom. The Christians would assemble. The believers would assemble to break bread, to recognize the resurrection, to acknowledge we're under grace. Shabbat, again, is going to bring you back down to thinking on the earthly because what did God promise Israel? Israel's future is millennial reign, heaven on earth. It is down here, and God's got a purpose in that. And, I, and by the way, all of you who think law is done, go to the verses on the millennium, and you're going to find out during the millennium they're living under law, and they're keeping that law. We're going to find out sacrifices get reestablished at a point. I don't know all the sacrifices that will be during the millennium, but I know some of them because I read about them. So there's a lot there that we have a lot of questions for. But my point is, God gave that to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. In our age of grace, the Gentile does not have to proselyte into Judaism. You had to do that before the cross to show that you believed in the God of Israel and his coming Redeemer. Now you don't have to go under that to show that. You accept the Lord into your heart because the work is done. You've got the one-on-one -on -one relationship. And the Jewish person is never told in Scripture, now you can't practice anything Jewish. You have to cut that off, and you have to go into a church, and you have to act like a Gentile. Hello. <laughs> God made them Jewish. He expects them to be Jewish. God made them Gentile. He expects them to be Gentile. Can you cross over and enjoy in both? Absolutely you can. It's not commanded you cannot, and it's not commanded thou shalt except in the original, you know, beginning and all of that. Um, the early believers, if you want, when they worshiped on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verses 6 and 7, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17, these are all in your cross-references. But let me take you real quickly to Galatians. Galatians was written because there was a group of people that were called Judaizers. These people were saying, hey, you can't let go of law. You have to keep law. You have to do this. You have to do that. The Gentiles, they, they've got to do these things. It's, they can't get, you know, they can't be saved without this. And there was a whole controversy going on. Show Paul had taught to some of these people before. He had brought them into understanding that salvation was through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, that that picture has been completed. These people were, were saying, okay, Jesus is... Now, died and resurrected, and we add him into our law. So they were saying, in essence, it's Jesus and the law. This is who Shaul Paul took to task. This is where he's saying, whoa, 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 Salvation is by Yeshua Jesus alone, not Jesus and anything. Not Jesus in your works, not Jesus in someone else's works, not Jesus and clean yourself up first, get yourself in a good place, and then come to nothing. You can't work your way to heaven and you can't keep yourself safe. That's all the work of Yeshua Jesus. 
So he's taking these on in the book of Galatians, these Judaizers, in chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, you know, God knows you personally now, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and the worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? See, they were saying, okay, yeah, we've added in Jesus for salvation, but if you want to be saved, thou shalt, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do that. And they were putting all of these burdens on the, the believers who were coming in also and saying that they have to keep the law. They have to do this and they have to do that. And Paul was saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. You now know God. God, excuse me, knows you. And you want to go back and, and slave yourself, put yourself into those things? Look at his example. You observe days, months, seasons, years. Okay, now he's starting to hit on, oh, if you don't keep, let's say, Passover, the way that it's commanded in, in the original covenant, then you're not saved. You've got to have Jesus and you've got to keep Passover. And all through this book says, wait a minute, and through the book of Hebrews also, by the way, he says, look at Passover. It's a picture of this. That's the shadow of what was coming. Now, do you want to embrace a shadow? If you've got Yeshua Jesus and his shadow is being cast, because anybody, you walk out in the sunshine, you see your shadow, don't you? Now, if I go up and here's Yeshua Jesus, and instead of grasping hold of him and hugging him and loving him and, and having that relationship with him, if I go to his shadow and say, oh, I want to hug the shadow. I love this shadow. It is such a beautiful shadow. Look at its shape. That's what Paul's saying. Don't do that. Don't be so foolish. You've got the reality now. Grasp hold of the reality. Realize this is a picture looking toward that, but here's the real. This is what you embrace. That's what he's telling them. Now, can I keep Passover? Can I go through that ceremony? And can I say, look, look at how all these things tell us about Yeshua, about his work. Uh, the matzah. A picture of him being bruised for us, broken for us, buried for us, resurrected for us. The one who finds him gets a prize. Can I not take that, embrace that, and, and include that in my memories and share that with others, especially with the Gentiles who are finding out about this, and have it glorify the real? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, am I keeping Passover because... I have to keep this exactly like this, and I have to do it in this order, and I have to do it this way, or, or you know, I'll, I'll suffer the wrath? No, no. But I realized that was a picture of my Messiah. Everything was a picture. The rest was a picture of Messiah's rest in that tomb. Him coming out of the tomb, a picture of resurrection. When I look at creation, I see, remember how we did the tabernacle in creation? I see God wanted a tabernacle with us through my Jewishness. I'm not going to stop who I am. I'm not going to leave it behind any more than you can do division and leave behind addition and subtraction. Can you divide? Can you multiply without addition and subtraction? If you can, you're a miracle worker. <laughs> I'm going to keep moving on, see the complete picture. That's why I tell people I am not a converted Jew. Converted means I've changed from, I've turned from. From, I put my back to. I am not converted. I haven't left my Jewishness. But I haven't stopped there. I'm completed. I'm completed in Yeshua Jesus. So I'm going to bring my heritage in and I'm going to show and share. Look, it's a beautiful picture. But here's the reality. Don't miss him. Don't miss the real for the shadow. That's what Shaul Paul is saying. And don't trust in the shadow to save you. The shadow can't save you. But the real does. That's what we're seeing. So, in the future, when Messiah's kingdom is here on earth, when he's governing the whole earth, the whole earth is going to be under a rule of law. It's going to be under what justice would have come had the people lived right by the law. We're going to see that. Um, let me give you just two verses. Isaiah 66 and verse 23. 
And I am kind of going on this long today because there's so much controversy out there for it. And I hope it answers questions for all of you. You are who God wanted you to be, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile. And there's only one way to be saved, and that's through whether you call him Yeshua or you call him Jesus. He is the way of salvation, and that's all that matters. The other is a picture of that you don't, you don't become Jewish when you get saved, and you don't become Gentile when you get saved. You are what you were when you were born. You're just newborn. And, it's and you have received Christ in your heart. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Isaiah 66 and verse 23 says, And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Now, when you look at this chapter, put it in the context. I'll let you do it on your own later. You're going to see he's talking about the millennial reign. The thousand year reign of Yeshua Jesus on earth, sitting in a throne, where? In, in what city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the eternal headquarters. Well, I'm sorry, the eternal capital of Israel, the headquarters for Messiah when his kingdom's here on earth. So, when they're living during that millennial time, they're going to observe the moons, the Sabbaths, and all mankind's going to come up and bow down. They're all going to come up and worship when they're supposed to come up and worship. Now, one last proof text, because I like two or three sources, you know that, go to Hezekiel, Ezekiel, chapter 46. Now, if you've been with me long enough, you know my little rundown. I'll start you real quick. In chapter 37 of Ezekiel, you have dry bones. Is asked, man of God, can these bones live again? Okay? It's a picture of there's life, but there's no spiritual life. The spirit's not in. It's just bones. That's Israel today. She is back in the land. She is alive. She doesn't have the spirit of God in her. I'm talking collectively. I'm not talking individually. Okay? That's chapter 37. Chapter 38, 39 take us through what culminates in the battle of Armageddon to open Israel's eyes to who her Messiah is because God said, yes, those bones can live again. I will put my spirit in them. By the end of chapter 39, the battle of Armageddon has taken place. Messiah has come back, stopped the battle. He is setting up his kingdom now with those who have believed in him for salvation. Chapter 40 on describes a temple that is gorgeous. Don't get confused. This is not the temple that will be built during the tribulation. This is not the temple that the Antichrist is going to put his image in and say, you worship me. He's going to so desecrate that temple. It's going to be as bad as back in the day when Antiochus Epiphanes did it. It's going to be utterly worthless. It's going to be so polluted. That's a good word. It's polluted. Okay? There is a third temple coming. It will be built either just before or right at the beginning of the tribulation period. I kind of tend to think, but I could be wrong, I kind of tend to think it'll be built right at the beginning. I'm not sure that we'll see it, but we see the rumors of it now. They have everything they need ready to go into that temple. Right down to the high priest's garments are already made. All of the paraphernalia, every instrument they use in temple worship is in the Temple Treasury Institute. And they stress these are not museum pieces. When we have our temple, we empty this place out and we put it all into service. That's how close we are. We might see the temple built. Don't freak if you do. God doesn't tell us which side of the rapture that happens on. But we know it is built. We know the sacrifices is going on by the midpoint of the tribulation because the Antichrist goes into the temple and says, this is my throne. You're going to worship me. Say, I'll let you build it, is what I'm thinking he did. I'll let you build it. In the back of my mind, knowing all along, you're building it for me. But I'll let you think you were doing it for yourself so that we'd make nice and we'd have peace. But I was only doing it for my own good. That's why I tend to think it'll probably be built after we're gone. But again, if I see it built, it does not bother me the least. It just tells me we're that much closer. <laughs> in the millennium, I mean, I'm sorry, in the middle of the tribulation, he, he puts his image in the temple, bow down to him. The whole place is desecrated. That is not the temple that is now being described in chapter 40. The battle of Armageddon happens at the end of the tribulation. So the, the abomination that made the temple desolate, made it empty, was in the midpoint 
Three and a half years later, you have the Lord stop the battle, stop the war, and now set up his kingdom. So, Ezekiel 38, 39, stop at the battle. Chapter 40 starts a description of the temple that the Lord's going to build. This is huge. It doesn't even fit on the platform that they have now. It's too big. It needs to be because all the nations are going to be coming up. It's got to be bigger. And it's far more glorious if for no other reason the glory of the Lord's going to fill it. That's the description we get. His glory comes in and fills it. Remember the tabernacle when his Shekinah glory was in the one area, the Holy of Holies, and how beautiful that was, that, that the cloud had to, to cover the glory to some degree so they wouldn't be blinded from it. And we know how Moshe glowed from the glory of it. That's going to fill the whole temple. What chapter is the, Starts third, with the third temple? The third temple is spoken of. It's not told about it being built. It's spoken of. In Matthew 24, verse 15, we know that, that it's already in motion, and there are other scriptures in the original that I'll go look up for you later that talk about temple worship. The fourth is the one we get the description of. Chapter 40, all the way to the end of Ezekiel, eight chapters given to tell us what that temple is going to be like, and you see very clearly the glory of the Lord fills it, the Lord is sitting in it. Do you think he's going to sit in that third one during the tribulation period with all the sin going on and call it beautiful and make it huge? No, but actually when he even comes back and he, he splits the Mount of Olives and the valley opens up in the way that it does, he's even making ring men for the temple that he's going to bring into that area and the description that's given. So when we read in chapter 46, remember 40 to 48 is all the millennial temple. That's the fourth temple. Do I see four temples in scripture? Yes. Two are already done, one to come during tribulation, one to come after. Ezekiel 46 says, Thus says the Lord God, The gate of the inner court facing east shall be shut the six working days, but it shall be open on the Shabbat. Interesting. The temple opens up on the Shabbat. The gates that they go through to go do their work are closed on Shabbat. During the millennium, they're keeping Shabbat, and God's helping them keep it. It's open on the day of the new moon. Okay, the, the, the Sabbath day and the new moon. Um, that's to do temple worship. The prince shall enter by way of the porch, and it goes on and tells what the prince is going to do. The prince is not Messiah. He's king. Prince is one who's bringing in sacrifices for his sin, so he's not Messiah. Um, probably we want to go down to three and four. The people of the land shall also worship at the doorway of the gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths, on the new moons. The burnt offering which the prince shall offer to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be, and it describes what he's going to bring in. So we see sacrifices going on. We see them being brought to the door of the temple. We see that, that the one who is leading them in that is called a prince because he is under the king. He's the son of the king. What's the son called? He's called a prince. You know, it could very possibly be David because David will have a key role. Um, David will sit on the throne in the Messiah because the Messiah is the one who fulfills that. But David's got a role also, so it could be. I'm not saying it is because I don't know. Scripture doesn't say. Okay, but my point is, kingdom will kingdom, kingdom, the kingdom period, the millennial reign, will be a time of law, a time of keeping the Shabbat, a time of bringing in sacrifices. They'll bring in their first fruits from the world. If the nations don't bring in their first fruits and worship the Lord, they won't receive rain. They won't keep having crops to bring in. God's going to let their land dry up, okay, because they're having to keep it. So we see that, that God does not do away with the Shabbat in relation to Israel. We see it in her future history also. Remember, we are not replacing Israel. We are a different body. We are the body of the Messiah made up of majority Gentile. But thank you, Lord. Jewish no, people too. You, Lord. Okay. <laughs> We're mixed in there together. The same way that before this time, when they had a proselyte in Judaism, the majority was Jewish with a few Gentiles mixed in. Okay, now we've got the opposite. The time is coming again where the Jews will be the leaders for the world. They will be what God made the Israel nation to be. They will be a priest representing me to the nations. They will finally be doing the job that the Lord had wanted them to do. Thank you, Roger. So with all that in mind, 
back to our he rested <laughs> and I see our clock we're going to have to end here but I want to finish the thought so that we have it complete so go back with me to Genesis and we see that that um, by the seventh where is it okay it's in the middle of verse two by the seventh day and we already talked about seventh day God completed we talked about what completed meant his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done he didn't rest out of tiredness. He rested to show his creative work was done and to give a pattern to man how to structure his time. That he needs to stop, he needs to rest, and he needs to reflect on his God. And chapter and, 2. And chapter 2. That's the second verse of chapter 2. And I did just find in my notes, it was during the French Revolution that they tried to make the 10-day week. And it just did not work. God set this into motion. That's what he's making clear here. We are now in a seven-day cycle. This is how God ordained time, and this is the way that we move forward. So when we pick up next week, we're going to see he blessed that seventh day. We're going to see what that means. He sanctified it. How do you sanctify a day? <laughs> what is he telling us in that? What is that a picture of? And he's going to reinforce again because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So God's death, he has rested, not out of tiredness, but out of completeness. The picture is there. Now God says, let me make sure I understand the picture. And let me give it to you clearly. So hopefully today it even clears up for any of you. Which day do I have to? No. Which day should I? Which day do I want to? Which day is God telling me? I am a Gentile believer. I am a Jewish believer, and I'm telling you, whichever way he made you, he made you beautiful. He made you the way that he loves you and the way he wants you to be. So you don't need to try to be something you're not. If you're not Jewish, you don't need to try to be. If you're not Gentile, you don't need to try to be. You just need to embrace how God made you and take it into the complete picture that God has made and realize we all come together in Yeshua for salvation and for the eternal rest. We didn't get into that eternal rest, but we will talk about it. Time will come when we will, the, the, the difference. Next week also, I'll tantalize you. Many of you may have heard the controversy. Well, we don't know if these were really 24-hour days or not. They might have been periods of time. The more that give room for evolution, which we've already thrown out. But is it periods of time or is there something in here that gives us conclusive proof that we're talking about 24 hour days I'll answer the question <coughs> next week <laughs> so hopefully you'll want to come back and you'll want to hear